Welcome back to me chatting in my chair here in my hotel room in uh, Mesot, Thailand. I've been putting out some basic update videos about my life here during the uh, COVID-19 lockdowns that are going on around the world. But today's video is going to be uh, quite a bit different. I've had a lot of time, of course, to think here by myself in this hotel room, as I'm sure all of us have. And there is a lot of food for thought in this COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. There's a lot of big picture ideas you can think about to do with the whole world and history and politics and other pandemics in history, how this one is different. You can think about big picture ideas to do with medicine and treatment of viruses, the history of viruses. You could go on and on and on and you see that in the media, which is dominated with articles about this pandemic from every possible point of view. But there's also narrow topics that you can kind of focus on and there's a lot of food for thought there as well. For example, just coming at the pandemic from the point of view of a foreigner stranded overseas during a, you know, a disaster, a big disaster. And it occurred to me that this is actually the second time that this has happened to me. In this video, I'm going to compare the two disasters that I've been personally involved in. This one, you know, COVID-19, and the other one from my past. And I'm going to do it mainly by telling the story of that first disaster. And I'm going to focus on similarities for a foreigner who is like caught up in the disaster. So I'm going to focus on the similarities between that disaster and this one. The video will likely end up to be uh, kind of a long one, sorry for that. I'll probably break the video up into two parts, but I will have lots of uh, sections in there with a list of timestamps, so you can scan the list. And if something catches your eye, something that I note in the list of timestamps, you know, you can just click on that and then jump around the video, you know, if you don't want to uh, watch the whole thing. And I'm going to try to insert some photos and video clips of my own from the previous disaster, just to illustrate some of the things that I'm talking about and, you know, break it up a little bit. So uh, I hope that uh, that makes it a little bit easier to, uh, to get through. The first disaster for me took place in the Philippines quite a long time ago now. It was back in 2013. I was in the city of Tacloban and ironically I was there mainly because there was an immigration office in Tacloban City and um, I went to the immigration office to extend my tourist visa for an additional 60 days. And while I was there, I spotted a newspaper on the table and the main article on the front page was about a typhoon that was heading towards Tacloban and it was scheduled to arrive probably by the next morning. I saw that article about the approaching typhoon and I didn't think that much about it. Um, I used to live in Taipei and a lot of typhoons uh, would hit Taiwan so I've had a lot of uh, experience with them they could cause a lot of flooding and damage in the mountains of Taiwan. So they were serious events, you know, don't get me wrong. But in Taipei, they were treated a little bit differently. You know, the typhoon would normally hit southern Taiwan, kind of based on the path it would be following. Or if it went to the north, it would kind of go north of Taipei. But sometimes there would be just enough of an effect from the typhoon for Taipei to shut down. And that was always quite an experience because you might get a day off work. You know, they would declare a typhoon day. And I remember sitting in my rooftop apartment in Taipei, you know, on the sixth floor with nothing between me and the uh, storm system, but a, you know, sheet of galvanized tin kind of. 
and the you know the pound the noise of the pounding rain and the howling wind and you would just sit there in your apartment and wait it out you usually got a, a lot of warning warnings of these approaching typhoons so you would go to the store stock up on food and water you know for one day maybe two days the power might go out for a short period of time but nothing that dramatic would happen i mean in terms of just sitting there and listening to this massive storm raging around you in your rooftop apartment, it, it actually was quite a, you know, an interesting and, and almost pleasant experience. And then after the typhoon has passed, you go outside onto the street and there's a strange mood in the air. You know, you go out to see some of the trees that have fallen over. Work crews are already out repairing hydro lines and removing the trees or just putting them back into position. Some scooters and motorbikes have fallen over. But, you know, um, you can go to the local 7-Eleven, which has almost definitely opened up already. Get yourself a uh, cappuccino to go, buy whatever you need, and that would be your experience of the typhoon. So in uh, Tacloban, with this typhoon approaching, I didn't uh, think much of it. You know, it did change my plans to an extent because I was thinking that once I got my visa extension, I was gonna get, going to get on my touring bicycle and leave Tacloban the next morning. But with this typhoon coming, I thought, yeah, that's probably not a good idea. So I changed my plans and I decided to just hunker down for one night and the next day in Tacloban, wait for the typhoon to pass over, and then I can set off on my bicycle and continue my journey. Now, you might have figured out where this story is going because this was 2013 and that typhoon turned out to be no ordinary typhoon. This was Super Typhoon Yolanda, or I think internationally it was known as Super Typhoon Haiyan. And at that time, it was the most powerful typhoon in history to make landfall. It might still hold that record today, I don't know. Plus, this wasn't just a typhoon with high winds and heavy rain. I mean, a Category 5 has incredibly powerful winds, you know, that will tear the roof off a house, that will throw cars across the street. I mean, it's, it's something to deal with. And the amount of rain can cause, you know, a lot of damage as well. So it's not something to take lightly. You hear Category 5 typhoon, you know, something serious is going on. But this typhoon, coming with all of its powerful winds and heavy rain, also arrived with a storm surge. And I don't know all the physics involved with a storm surge, but this typhoon swirling around out there in the ocean was so powerful that it was pushing a wall of water ahead of it. And in Tacloban City, the water receded from the shoreline. So this typhoon was pushing this giant wall of water and it was sucking all the water away from the shore. Later on, I spoke to witnesses in Tacloban who saw this, you know, they, they were standing on the shore and they were looking down at a muddy, dry ocean floor, you know, with the, the water level like far, far out, out to sea. And that was just such a weird thing to happen. If you think about what happened here in Thailand and, and all around Asia back in 2004, there was the earthquake and the tsunami. 
and there's a lot of videos online about this. I'm kind of addicted to these kinds of disaster videos, so I've watched every video I could find about the 2004 tsunami and also the uh, tsunami that hit Japan. I've watched as many of those videos I can find. And some of the most interesting ones from Thailand were shot by tourists on the beach and it was just a normal day at the beach for them but then the water started to recede and the water just went out and out and out and then all these foreigners were standing there wondering you know what the heck is going on you know they were just looking at an empty ocean like a, a, a huge low tide or something like that and everybody's there filming and taking pictures and talking about this and wondering what's going on now we know that if you see the water pulling away from shore and going far away from shore don't stand there and shoot video that's the time to turn around run and head for the highest point of land you can find because that means a tsunami is on its way and that's exactly what happened in Tacloban with Super Typhoon Yolanda. They don't call it a tsunami. I mean, they call it a storm surge, but that's kind of a technical difference in terms of what it is. It, it kind of amounts to the same thing. And based on what I found out later and what I saw and from talking to people, the storm surge that hit Tacloban ahead of this typhoon was as high as 25 feet. So it's a 20 to 25 foot wall of water just barreling into the city and just wiping out everything it hit. Uh, later on, I saw trees all over Tacloban and they had debris stuck in branches at the tops of the tree, you know, as high as 25 feet. So that was evidence of just how high this uh, wave was, you know, that hit the city. And I heard stories from so many people, you know, their experiences in this typhoon and dealing with the storm surge that people were, their lives were saved by the trees. I mean, they were floating in this water. Their house had been completely flattened. The wave had swept them away and they grabbed hold of these trees, you know, 20, 25 feet above the ground and held onto the tree for dear life. And that uh, saved their life. Um, another very dramatic story I heard several times was that on just the inner ring road of Tacloban, there were some houses that were a bit more sturdy and they could be two or three stories high, you know, with windows up at the top. And with it, when the storm surge hit, the water reached all the way up to the second and third floor and people were floating in the water outside the window of these houses and they were in trouble and then people would reach out the window, grab their hands, and then pull them in to safety. Um, and one man told me a story about this that was quite tragic. There were several people outside his window, and he reached out and pulled one person in, he pulled a second one in, and then he had to kind of put them down on the floor in his, uh, in his house. But by the time he went back to the window, the third person, a woman, was gone because this water, this storm surge, was not just water. It contained the debris of hundreds, thousands of houses that had just been flattened. So everything that, was, that made up the outer shell of the house, all the contents of the house, everything was floating in the water. So this flood was this thick soup of heavy wood, trees, metal, refrigerators, televisions, anything that was floating. And even if you are you know, a strong swimmer, 
you know, I've often thought, you know, if, you know, if I get caught in a flood or something, um, it won't be that terrible for me because I grew up in the water. You know, I was like a fish growing up and I'm quite a strong swimmer. So I thinking, you know, I can stay afloat. But this was not water. I mean, this was a, a floating debris pile. And by the time this man came back to the window to pull in this woman, you know, some debris had closed over her head and she couldn't get back to the surface. And of course, she drowned. And later on, when the typhoon had passed and the water had receded, he found the body of this woman. He had seen her face and he recognized her. He found her body in the debris, you know, below his house. So she had, uh, you know, died in the, uh, in the storm surge. This was easily the biggest and most dramatic experience of my life. I don't think I'll ever experience anything like it again. The world essentially vanished in an instant. Everything was gone. No electricity, no water, no food, no government, no police, no banks, no ATMs, uh, no drinking water, no restaurants, no markets. Nothing was left of the city except for a few of these, you know, heavier, thicker, you know, more solid buildings made of concrete. But even those were flooded and most, if not all, of the uh, contents destroyed. Even the streets were impassable. So there were no cars, no motorcycles, no tuk-tuks, nothing like that. And for most people, their homes had been completely destroyed. Some buildings were still standing in Tacloban, of course. Most of the immediate and total destruction was along the coastline. But in the interior, with you know more solid concrete buildings, a lot of those were still standing, but they had been completely flooded and suffered an incredible amount of damage, and everything inside them had also been destroyed. Even where I was staying, um, at my hotel, the surge of water that hit there was about 10 feet deep. Uh, luckily, my room was on the second floor, so the worst of the flood never quite reached my room. 
it was so crazy and scary because the water came up like right to the edge and was kind of lapping against my toes, threatening to then flood my room. But that's as high as, uh, as the water got. It was such a strange experience. You know, you go to bed the night before thinking you're going to go to sleep, wake up in the morning and life will go on as normal. You'll go to the local shop, you'll go to the restaurant and have breakfast, you'll go to the ATM and uh, take some money out, and then you'll go about your life. But the world essentially was gone. The typhoon was particularly devastating in Tacloban because there were large informal settle settlements all along the ocean on all the sides of the city. There were thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people living there in kind of makeshift homes that they've built over, you know, over decades really that community has existed and they would build their homes out of whatever material they could find. So they had very thin walls and galvanized uh, tin. Um, and there's so many people living there and that's where the storm surge hit and it just wiped out those communities completely. You know, all those houses were turned into matchsticks, like I said. And this storm surge was so powerful that it actually lifted up and carried a large number of ocean going freighters, you know, those ships that weigh tens of thousands of tons, the storm surge carried them into the city and then deposited them on top of the city, on streets and on top of these fields of destroyed houses uh, below them. I haven't looked into the stories for a long time, so I don't know if those ships are still there. I kind of feel like they are still there because how in the world do you move them back into the water? And in my time in uh, Tacloban, they were rebuilding those communities. So now you suddenly had hundreds of new homes built in that area between the ship and the water. So how would you, even if you could drag the ship, how would you get that ship through all these new houses? Would you have to destroy all the houses again to get the ship back into the ocean? I have no idea. You know, maybe they did it, but for all I know, the ships are, are still there inside uh, Tacloban, kind of as, as a monument to uh, this uh, disaster.
obviously my situation here in Mesot is nothing like as serious as what happened in uh, Takloban. Um, the two situations are quite different. There are still shops open here and there's food and water and I have electricity, water running in the bathroom, I have the internet, um, all these things. But as I open this video with, there are similarities between these two disasters, these two situations when you look at it from the point of view of a foreigner caught up in it, kind of psychological similarities and physical, logistical ones, and that's kind of what I want to uh, get into now. One similarity is how both disasters kind of snuck up on me. As I said, I, I saw news that the typhoon was coming, but I didn't know anything about the severity of it. Um, I saw people in Takloban kind, kind of preparing for it. They were carrying old car tires up onto their roof and putting them on the galvanized tin as kind of a weight to try to prevent them from blowing away in the typhoon. But that's kind of all the preparation I saw for the most part. People were laughing and joking and going about their day normally. So I had no reason to uh, take this typhoon that seriously. And I was actually, in, in a weird way, kind of prepared because I had my bicycle with me with all of my touring and camping gear. So I had tools, I had, you know, a mosquito net, I had a water filter, water um, purifying tablets. I had a cook stove with fuel, you know, so I could cook. And I had, I don't know, a week or two weeks worth of food in the cupboard, just basic staples, and I had some water there. Um, yeah, so by chance, you know, I was actually kind of as prepared for this situation as, as I could have been, you know, given the circumstances. But I certainly learned my lesson, you know, that the, the world can vanish in an instant, which is similar to this COVID-19 crisis. As I said, I still have access to food and water and all that kind of thing. But the world, you know, changed very, very quickly. And I think it took a lot of people by surprise. And you do see in some parts of the world, there is a concern for shortages. I've seen the stories where you know, stores are running out of supplies. I've seen video and pictures of empty shelves. There's panic buying and hoarding. Um, so there's a concern for food and water. So I think before a disaster, you know, people tend to have this sense that things are permanent. When you go to the grocery store, it's always full of food. It just sort of shows up there by magic and it feels like any changes are going to be gradual and you will be, be able to prepare for it over time because you will see the incremental changes. But that's not really a, how it works. You know, with a typhoon like that and with COVID-19, it can sneak up on you in the background and then it hits like so dramatically and then everything suddenly is gone. Even in the moment in Takloban with the typhoon hitting, it took me a long time to get up to speed and figure out what was really going on. It, again, it was kind of a, a gradual realization of the situation. I was really so dumb. It was almost a comedy of errors. I went to bed the night before thinking everything's going to be fine. And then I woke up the next morning to the sound of the wind and the rain, you know, as the outer edges of the typhoon were hitting. And a weird thing about my room was that I couldn't close the windows entirely. There was one window that no matter what I did, I couldn't get it to close all the way. It was jammed in some way. I think the wall had twisted. There was nothing blocking it, but I could not get it to close. So there was quite a large gap on one side. And then as the typhoon hit and the rain got heavier and heavier, and the wall of my room was facing directly into the typhoon. Rainwater just poured in through the window. And I had a room 
much smaller than this one, but with a similar design with two beds. And the bed closest to the window was the one where I had all of my gear laid out and I had gear all over the floor. And then I was sleeping in the other bed furthest away from the window. So all of this rain was like flooding in and soaking everything on the bed. And I had camera gear there, you know, I, I had all kinds of things there, sleeping bag and clothing. It was all getting soaked. And this big flood of water was spreading across the floor. This had nothing to do with storm surge or anything that 25 foot of water, wall of water was still on its way. This was just rain coming in. So I leaped out of bed and then I'm desperately trying to save everything on my bed to put it over onto the other bed to dry it up and cover everything up. And then I got out a, a towel with a bucket and I put the bucket on the ground and then I'm sopping up the water with this towel, wringing it into the bucket, soaking, wringing, soaking, wringing, trying to push back this flood of water. And then when the bucket was full, you know, I'd race over to my bathroom. I had my own bathroom there and I'd pour the water down into the uh, toilet, go back and uh, try as I might. I, I couldn't keep ahead of this flood. It just kept coming in and coming in and things were flooding higher and higher in my room. And I'm just, you know, <laughs> running around like a crazy person trying to deal with all these little things. And outside, you know, in the real world, it's so strange now when I think about it, the storm surge hit and houses were being destroyed. Entire families were dying. Um, I think the, there were totals um, afterwards that went estimates that went as high as about 15,000 people died in this uh, typhoon in this area. So there was this huge tragedy going on out there, but I didn't know anything about it. I was in this little room, you know, just soaking up the water. And, and that's, you know, kind of what I was dealing with. That's what I saw in my immediate world. I hadn't shifted gears into this, the world has vanished mode. I was just trying to keep my room dry, which is so strange when you think about it. And in a way, I mean, that's similar to me and Mesod with the pandemic because I came here, you know, to get my visa to go back to Myanmar. I, I knew about the um, virus in, in China, in Wuhan, you know, there's news stories about this. There were stories of it spreading and little, you know, nothing really that major going on, nothing to make me think that I should make some big moves. And then before I knew it, you know, the border into no, Myanmar, boom, it closed. Border into Malaysia, boom, it closed. All the other borders closed. And, and here we are, you know, so it kind of, kind of sneaks up on you. And then this situation in Tacloban also, even as the typhoon had arrived, it took me so long, you know, for my brain to catch up with the seriousness of what was happening. And I remember so clearly the moment the power went out. I had an air conditioner in that room in Tacloban and it was running. And I think I was still lying in bed. I don't think I was fighting the flood yet. And I was lying in my bed and the air conditioner was running. And then I heard a click, click. And the little light, you know, on the air conditioner went out and electricity was gone, right? So again, with my previous experience of typhoons, Stor and even storms in Canada and other places. Well, okay, the power's out and I will have to do without power for today. But I'll come. I have a couple of candles, I, I have a flashlight and the power will come back on tomorrow or the next day. You know, that's what you're thinking of. What I didn't realize was that in Tacloban, the power would not return for months. 
By the time I left Tacloban, I actually stayed there for almost the full two months um, after the uh, typhoon hit for a variety of reasons, maybe I'll talk about it later. And in the entire two months that I was there, the power never came back. So a life without electricity became standard. That was the new reality for me, where, you know, in a, in a, in a weird way, it was not that unusual for me because being a cyclist, you wake up before dawn, you know, wherever you're going out on your bike. I do anyway, I'm a morning person. So I would get in the habit of waking up even before the sun is rising. And I would often be on the road riding my bike in the dark before the sun had even come over the horizon. And it's just such a glorious feeling to be out on the road, cool morning, and then you're there for sunrise, you know, coming up. And then you go to bed at, at uh, sunset. You know, once the sun goes down and it's dark, if you're a long distance cyclist, that's when you go to bed. You know, you get into that rhythm. Um, so I was a little bit used to it, but still I was not prepared for this in uh, Tacloban, where I was lying in my bed. I hear the typhoon. I hear this click. Electricity's gone. Oh, it'll be gone for one day. But that moment actually signaled two months of living in the dark, of lighting candles, of, yeah, just, you know, being in a dark world without electricity. You don't realize how long these things are going to last. You think, oh, it'll be two hours. Then you adjust your expectations. Oh, it'll be today. Oh, it'll be tomorrow. Oh, it'll be one week. And then suddenly that one week stretches into three, then into a month, you know, into two months. I don't know when full power ever returned to Tacloban. I have no idea how long it took, but you know, it took a very long time. And it's interesting that it takes time for your brain to adjust to these realities. And we're going through the same thing now with this pandemic, because I think at the beginning of all this, you automatically think, oh, lockdown. You, know, you see it in the stories of YouTubers from all around the world. They all say the same thing. You're in Peru. Oh, there's going to be a, you know, a seven day lockdown and you adjust your sense of reality to match seven days of being in this hotel room, being in this city. And then now it's two weeks. Oh, it's been extended. Now it's one month. Oh, now it's two months. Is it going to be four months? Is anybody right now prepared for four months of this, <clears throat> you know, of being unable to move on? It's just so fascinating the way the brain takes time to catch up with these realities and the slow process of it. But also what strikes me about both of these disasters, which gives me optimism, you know, it's a positive thing, is how capable we as humans are to adapt to new realities. We adjust to it, whatever the reality is, so fast and it really does become normal. For example, living without electricity in Tacloban. It just got hardwired into my system. It became normal. And a moment I will never forget is when I finally left Tacloban. As I said, this was two months in the future. My bicycle had been repaired. I, the roads had been cleared. And I was riding my bike out of the area of Tacloban City. And the very first night, I guess I got far enough away, you know, that a lot of the damage had uh, disappeared. And I moved into this hotel, which was open, and I got a room, and I hadn't even been thinking about this. I paid for the room, and then I went into this room. It was late in the day, and it was getting dark, and I flicked on the light switch. And I swear, my whole body reacted. It was, I, I was like a, a Neanderthal seeing magic when I flicked on that switch and the light was on and it was such a powerful feeling. I just turned the light on and off, on and off, off and on. It was so much fun. I would go into the bathroom, turn on the water, and water came out of the tap. It was just, it was like every Christmas day I'd ever had in my whole life rolled into one 
small experience. It was just so exciting. And I realized how much I had adapted to life without water, without running water and without electricity. You know, those basic things is flicking on that light and the light comes on and the whole room is lit up. And it was so easy to do things. All these tiny little details that took up so much of my time in Tacloban because the simple things in life, you know, in, at night, for example, if you needed to go to the bathroom in the dark, you know, kind of lighting a candle and going somewhere and dealing with everything, anything you wanted to do was so difficult and complicated. And then now I flicked on that light and it was like, whoa, everything is so easy to do. Charging batteries for my camera, and I was dry, you know, in, in Tacloban, I would never, nothing ever seemed to dry. The, the whole city was soaked and muddy all the time. Everywhere you went, you were soaking wet and muddy. Everything was dirty. It was just such a difficult existence. And now I was clean and dry with running water and electricity. It was incredible, but it was an indication of how much I had adapted to that new reality. And I wasn't even aware of it. So it makes me think about this situation with COVID-19. You know, I'm, I'm adapting to a lot of things, but maybe I'm not even aware of it. Um, like what the, you know, what switches are being tripped in my head where, you know, I've been inside this room now for I don't know how many days. And what is that doing to the way I behave and the way I think reality is? I might have this you know, instinct to go up to people and talk to them, but then you kind of stop. Oh, no, you're not supposed to do that anymore. You can't just, you know, you'd think, for example, me being trapped in this hotel, maybe it's a good chance to become friends with the young men that, that run this place down in the lobby. You know, I should go down there, hang out with them, learn some Thai, you know, and then you think, oh, yeah, I could go. Then you get up to go do that. It's no, no, no. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to get face to face with a person and have conversations with them and hang out in the lobby in a big group. You know, the police will come and say, no, 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 you uh, no groups, you know, let's break up this gathering, you know. So I'm getting used to this new reality and I wonder what it will feel like eventually when all these travel restrictions and social distancing restrictions will be lifted. I'm looking forward to what that will feel like and, and how I will react to it. Will it be <laughs> so crazy and so amazing as in the Philippines, the first time I encountered an electric light, you know, after living in, in darkness for two months?
Thank you. 